Hey guys, it's Sasha. US inflation accelerated in August as gasoline prices jumped. August core inflation, excluding food and energy, rose 0.3%, hotter than expected. According to the media, US inflation is going up now, and we have a very big problem. But is it actually going up? And is there a problem? Or is it just a load of donkey poop? Well, I'll give you a clue. It is, in fact, a pile of ass excrement. Here is the latest data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and I've taken the 12 month number from July and stuck it here next to August so that you can go and compare the two. And just so that we can look at these numbers in context, I've added the numbers from 12 months ago from August 2022 as well. And to make it even easier, I've colored in the latest data so that you can see which numbers improved and which numbers got worse. The overall the overall rate of inflation is up at 3.7% compared to 3.2% last month. And you can see that the reason it's up is the oil price. Gasoline went up 10.6% in the last month, fuel oil is up 9.1%, and transportation services ticked up 2% as well. We'll cover that in a bit more detail later. If you combine the weight of energy commodities and transportation services, they add up to 9.6% of total inflation. And if you do the math, transportation services by themselves added over 0.1% to the inflation total this month, and energy commodities added almost 0.4%. So more than 0.5% point five percent of the month on month inflation number came just from the energy companies being greedy fucks when the oil price went up. The rest of inflation put together went up 0.1 percent, basically nothing. So why was I so mean about the energy companies just then? Well, here is the chart of the oil price since Russia invaded Ukraine. And you can probably remember how fast the price at the pump went up when the invasion first happened. As soon as the oil price began increasing, as soon as things began happening, you had to pay more that same evening. But then the price came back down in the fall of last year and was sitting in the 70s for a lot of this year. And did the price of filling up your car go right back down to where it was immediately. Did it fuck. And now Saudi Arabia and Russia are working like a well-oiled mm, cartel to pump the oil price by reducing production. And the price has gone back up very sharply to $90 in August and is now at almost $95 again. And of course, we immediately see the impact. Once again, gasoline prices up 10.6% month to month, and it will get worse when we get the September data. But when you're looking at inflation, it is critical to separate short-term noise from long-term inflationary pressures. The oil price going up and the price of the pump increasing is frustrating, it is annoying, and it is hard for people because being able to drive, to go around and do your stuff is a pretty crucial part of most people's life. And it will mean that some inflation goes up because the cost of transportation goes into the cost of pretty much everything else. But at the same time, this is a noise element. It is a specific commodity-driven indicator being pushed by a very specific time-sensitive particular trend that we are seeing with the price of oil right now. It is not an indicator that there is a sustained long-term inflationary problem. It is not an indicator that a wage price spiral or any other spiral is happening, that prices are blowing up because of sticky inflation taking hold or something else. And this is a very good thing because when you understand this, when you look at every everything else and the inflation data, you can see that everything else is doing great. Food inflation is down to just 4.3% and food at home is just 3.0%. These numbers are amazing compared to earlier this year or this time last year. And then look at the monthly numbers over the last six months. Food inflation is running at below the Fed's 2% annual target over the last six months months. Commodities, less food and energy are also doing great across the board. And very importantly, shelter has now dropped to 7.3%. Now, you won't see any mainstream media reporting on this because it's the opposite of panic, but the shelter inflation read has reduced more than expected. You can see the detailed shelter inflation data by googling shelter CPI and clicking on the St. Louis Fed link. And then you can click on this edit graph and at the bottom in the units bit, select percentage change from a year ago. And if we zoom in, 
you can see that shelter inflation peaked at 8.2% in March and is now beginning to decline and the declines are becoming more pronounced. Actually, it's declining faster than I expected than most people expected. And it's a bit surprising because although house prices have fallen in the first two quarters, the interest rates are a heck of a lot higher. So the cost of new mortgages is also higher. And you might think that a big reason for the drop sits in the Zumper report data. You can see that rent prices have started collapsing in August. These sat consistently for a long time at 12 to 15% through last year. And now in August, they dropped into the 2 to 4% range. And you can clearly see where the trajectory is heading. Now, remember that the data for shelter in the inflation report is delayed. It's delayed for good reason, but it is de delayed nonetheless. In the inflation data, rent inflation is at 78 and it has gone up 0.5% month on month in August, an annual equivalent of 6%. So the reason shelter data looks good is not so much that we have seen some kind of sudden decline in August. In fact, that is not at all what we're seeing. It is in fact because last summer, shelter numbers were even more insane. They were completely bonkers. And now that we are more than 12 months down the line, those insane numbers at the end keep dropping off. When you're looking 12 months back every single month, the stuff be that is older than 12 months does not go into the calculation anymore. And the good news is that in the rent data and in the various house price indicators that we're seeing, this shelter number will fall further in the coming months. We already see the data. We just need to wait for the lag effect to happen and for it to begin showing up in the CPI numbers. So while the Fed is telling you that inflation is sticky, it is a big problem, the only reason it is sticky is because their way of measuring it involves using an abacus and tallying it up on stone tablets. The only the only point of concern in this data is this transportation number, because oil explains the energy bit, but the transportation number, well, it's not quite what you think it is. Transportation in the CPI data is not what most people assume it means, because it kind of sounds like maybe it's things like buses and trains and going around and airplanes and stuff, but all of that is only 0.7 out of the 5.9% that the total weight of transportation is. In fact, the majority of transportation when it comes to inflation is insurance and motor vehicle maintenance and repair. And you can kind of see how these two are related, right? If cars cost a lot more to repair, insurance is gonna cost more too. And you can also see that these are the two items that have gone up a lot in inflation. In fact, these are the only two items that are driving pretty much all of the inflation in transportation. Insurance is up 19.1% in August, which is a lot. And I went and checked. And this is the highest annual rate of growth for insurance since 1976. And there are two things driving this primarily. A smaller part of the increase is because fixing low cost damage has become stupidly expensive on the newer cars. And I can completely see where this is coming from. Car manufacturers have made it intentionally impossible for local repair shops to fix relatively basic things without the manufacturer sticking their greedy fucking hands in there and taking some of the money for themselves. If someone just drives into the back of you and you need a new bumper, if you have parking sensors in there that are damaged, new cars will not let you just unplug the old parking sensor, throw it away and sticking a new one. This obviously sensible solution. No, instead your approved dealer, not the garage that you choose or the one that your insurance chooses. No, the approved very expensive dealer has to marry up the new sensor with a car computer or it will not work. And only the approved dealer who has access to your computer and to the systems can do it because only they can can access your car computer because even though you paid $40,000 for your car, you don't actually own your car and you can't access your own computer. This practice has exploded in the last five years because the car manufacturers are fucking dumb and they're just after stealing more money through any way that they can figure out how. It is becoming pointlessly expensive. On my own car, I own a Jeep. My rear parking camera has stopped working. I did not have an accident, nothing happened. It just stopped working one morning when I got into the car. The camera apparently has to be replaced. The take it or leave it price is $1,450 to replace it. 
to replace a shitty $20 camera in the boot of my car in a process that takes about 20 minutes to complete. Is the government doing absolutely anything to stop this racket? In the UK, in the US anyway, <laughs> to force you know car manufacturers to provide parts at reasonable cost to third parties and to force car manufacturers and manufacturers of other tech to allow third parties to do the repair so that there is competition. Well, I guess if you get elected by those car manufacturers, quite literally, you know which side your bread is buttered on. But it there is an even bigger problem with the cost of insurance. The United States has seen a big increase in recent years in natural disasters hitting the mainland. The hurricanes that have been hitting Florida, the East Coast and the Gulf Coast are becoming more frequent and becoming more severe. And the cost to insurance company is huge and this has now come to a point where this is beginning to severely impact the cost of insurance on cars. Because when one of these hurricanes arrives, it destroys all the cars that happen to be parked in its path. And insurers are meant to price this into the insurance in the affected states, but in reality, it is a commercially difficult decision because that would mean insurance in Florida would become astronomically expensive. And it is kind of the situation where it means that the rest of the country, in a way, has to subsidize extreme weather events that tend to happen more in only specific parts of the country. Now, going back to inflation. Transportation has been going up recently, but now we know why. We can see the information, we can see the data, and again, it is important to understand the key question. Is there some kind of a price spiral going on? That's when inflation can get out of hand. That's when you can get into the thousands of percent territory. That's when you can have a really big problem, and the answer is no. Is there a long-term accelerating inflationary pressure here? The answer is also no. And that is super useful because you can see that inflation overall has gone up from 3.2% to 3.7%. And you can see all the media freaking out about it. All the headlines are, oh my fucking God. The truth is that all the important numbers are trending down. Inflation is going down very rapidly and it did again in August. But in August, it was masked on its way down by a couple of one-off up upward factors. And by the way, these factors are still going to be there when we see the September data next month, because oil prices are still sitting high. But these are not pressures that can be fixed by increasing interest rates, because they are not demand-driven issues. They are not anything to do with what the rates can possibly influence. They are short-term noise driven by commodity prices and a very specific insurance industry adjustment that is currently happening. If you exclude this one of noise impact, US inflation has been running below the 2% target that the Fed have set since March this year the last six months. While everybody is busy panicking, the Fed is busy talking about sticky inflation and people are debating how high interest rates have to go, inflation is already there. But for some reason, everyone is refusing to look at the numbers and throwing their toys out of the pram, saying that inflation is now going to shoot all the way back up. The economy is going to crash hard in 2024. You must prepare. You must sell all your stocks. It's going to be the worst recession ever because the overall inflation number went up from 3.2 to 3. 0.7%. And you know, it is that time of year when all the YouTubers will start doing their best constipated faces again to tell you how bad the 2024 crash is going to be. And yes, inflation is not everything. I am not an idiot. I do understand it. Even though inflation has gone right back down, people are still suffering because nobody cancelled the inflation that has already happened earlier this year and happened the year before. And you can see that the consumer confidence is at an extremely low point. Consumer spending is low. Companies have slashed their advertising budgets. Online advertising is 30 to 60% cheaper than it was back in 2021, depending on the channel. That is an incredibly big drop. People are not buying, so companies are not advertising to those people that aren't buying because they don't get a return on their advertising spend. But low inflation means that every month, the situation economically, the situation financially for the people gets a little bit better. Wage growth in the United States is low. Hourly wages only grew by 4.3% in August. This, by the way, is a good thing because this is what's prevented the inflation situation from getting a lot worse. But the growth in wages is now higher than the rate at which inflation is growing overall and inflation on key items like food. So every month, people's financial position improves a little bit on average, which is a very good thing. The problem is that the Fed doesn't seem to understand this and has tightened monetary policy way too far already and might do more rate hikes starting this week. So the big question now is this. The storm has passed. 
and the house is still standing there, it seems to be just fine. Now, will the Fed turn up and blow the house up anyway out of spite? Have they already done enough damage that the house is going to collapse because the interest rates have just gone way too far? Will we now see a commercial real estate crisis or more banks struggling? Will the Fed keep rates high just because they said that they would, even if the data categorically does not support the rates staying where they are. It's going to be a very interesting few months to close out the year.